Let's look at salvation history in the letter to the Hebrews. Well, first we should have no doubt that Hebrews actually has a robust idea of salvation history. For one thing, there's a strong then and now contrast, which we've grown to expect in most New Testament literature. The first two verses of the book, God spoke of old to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken by his son. In Hebrews 9, the text speaks of a closed sanctuary, open only to the high priest, and he but once a year in the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. Literally, the text says that this is a parabole, a parable for the current age, implying that not only has Jesus Christ revealed the full meaning of this parable, this Old Testament story of the Holies of Holies, but also implying a future age in which Jesus will have opened the heavenly sanctuary to all God's children. Look at verse 9:10. It tells us that certain rites are in effect only until the time of the Reformation, implying that there's a point of inflection. And again, there's a world to come, Hebrews 2:5, and a city that is to come, Hebrews 13:14. What will this coming world be like, we might ask? Well, besides the fact we'll be able to enter into the heavenly sanctuary, we will see all things in subjection to Jesus, as opposed to the current age in which we don't see this, Hebrews 2.8. There's also in Hebrews a clear sense in which the Old Testament story finds the full flowering of its meaning in Jesus' death and resurrection, and in the life of the church. Look at Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. Psalm 95 our quote is quoted extensively here, and this looks back to the original experience of the wilderness generation. God swore in his wrath that that generation would not enter into his rest. Now, yes, the next generation under Joshua did in fact enter into the landed rest of promise, but that rest that they received is only a figure of the true rest. How do we know? Well, because David, the putative author of Psalm 95, wrote centuries after the first exodus and therefore must have been speaking of a more perfect rest to a future generation, a new today as it will in the future. Indeed, we the audience of Hebrews should see ourselves as like the wilderness generation, except that the stakes for us are much higher because the rest is so much greater and therefore the consequences of disobedience are also much greater. Now, by the way, this at work here is an exegetical te technique, a rabbinical one known as a kol homer, or light and heavy in the Hebrew. The way it works is this, if something is true in the lighter or lesser case, such as the death of the original wilderness generation and a loss of something lesser, a rest, then how much more will God's wrath be apparent in the greater case of unbelief, in a greater salvation that gives an infinitely greater rest? The Hebrews writer from the beginning combines Psalm 8 and Psalm 110 also. Both of these Psalms speak of a future Messiah figure who walks after the pattern of Adam and David. Paul also uses this, but the Hebrews writer zeroes in on one verse, Psalm 110 verse 4, the one that says, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He takes this verse and he runs with it. Here again, sequencing is crucial. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. The fact that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek in Genesis 14 implies that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Melchizedek is a greater high priest, therefore, than the priest of the order of Levi, since Levi, we know, is inferior to Abraham. He's a d d distant descendant of Abraham. Now, since Psalm 110 is also written much later than the priesthood of Aaron and Levi, established in the time of Moses, once again, this oath for this messianic priest king in Psalm 110 verse 4 must point ahead to a future kind of priesthood, a priesthood that the Aaron and Levi, which we now know to be merely provisional, one never meant to last forever. Now, this marriage of Psalm 8 and Psalm 110 and the combination of the idea of a royal messiah, 
who died and rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of God the Father, this combination of that idea with the idea over here of an eternal high priest who enters the heavenly sanctuary to once for all make an eternal offering, this really is the taproot of the whole theology of the letter to the Hebrews. Christ is not just a Messiah, nor is he even just a divine Messiah, but he's a messianic high priest. Once we can interpret with Hebrews Jesus' bloody death and resurrection as a consummate priestly act, we're really off to the races. Because then we can see that Jesus is superior in every way to the priests of old. As Hebrews 7 explains, Jesus' priesthood lasts forever because Melchizedek's did. He's appointed by God through Psalm 110 and isn't limited by his genealogical descent or membership in a certain tribe, unlike the priests of old. Moreover, though being a human gives him the ability to sympathize with human weakness, he doesn't have his own sins to make atonement for, unlike the priests of old. And besides that, he accomplishes the necessary offering all in one fell swoop, a once for all offering of, of all time, rather than in repeated offerings of the priest, offerings which we know actually are ineffectual. Why? Well, they have to be offered again and again. They have to be ineffectual. For moreover, the heavenly sanctuary in which Jesus, our high priest, ministers is better than the earthly one. Why? Because Exodus tells us, Exodus 25:40 tells us explicitly that this earthly sanctuary which Moses made was built as a pale imitation of the one he saw in heaven. Hmm, Moses, you know, maybe he's really the key for understanding how Jesus has fulfilled or perfected the Old Testament story in the theology of the letter to Hebrews. Now, yes, it's crucial that we understand the career of Moses, the spiritual giant, and why he remains the central figure of Torah for Jews everywhere, even to the present day. Now, yeah, he led Israel out of Egypt across the Red Sea, and yeah, he gave the law to Israel. And of course, most of you watching have probably known that basic story since you were kids. But what I'd like to focus on now is the experience of Moses atop Mount Sinai. This was a theophany. A theophany is a dramatic appearance of God himself, an appearance that Moses alone was privileged with seeing. Look at Exodus chapter 25, verses 15 through 18. It tells us Moses went up the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled upon Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days, and the seventh day he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord was seen as a consuming fire on top of the mountain. But Moses entered into the midst of the cloud and went up on the mountain. He was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. This is amazing. Smoke, clouds, fire, all in the presence of Yahweh, who is himself a consuming fire. It's hard for us to fathom, to imagine this man Moses in the presence of Almighty God. This is really the zenith of religious achievement of any human being in the Old Testament. In the tradition of Jewish rabbis like Moses Maimonides and Rashi and Nachmanides and a few other, a few other figures got close to this, but no one really achieved what Moses had. In some sense, Moses' failure to enter the Promised Land was anticlimactic. I mean, he had already seen God, and seeing the land could not be one one millionth of what he was privileged of seeing atop Mount Sinai. Anyway, notice what happens. The law is not given right away to Moses when he goes up the mountain, no. Instead, God spends six whole chapters giving Moses the commandment of the earthly sanctuary and tabernacle, and in fact showing him the pattern according to the heavenly tabernacle of which this earthly one which he is to build would be a mere tupas, a type. Now the key point to understand, the tabernacle in its construction was specifically intended to preserve the Sinai experience, to actualize it in perpetuity for all the children of Israel. This is after all what liturgy is meant to do to allow future generations 
to participate in central events in salvation history. Sinai is immortalized in the sanctuary. How? Well, here's the basic layout. The tabernacle is the tent at the center of the sanctuary. Inside the tabernacle is the Holy of Holies, uh, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. This is God's indwelling presence. Now, in the sanctuary, Israel surrounded this, and it Israel moved wherever the sanctuary went all throughout the wilderness. Well, okay, but what does this have to do with reproducing Sinai? Well, for one thing, the incense that we see commanded in Exodus 30 is actually explained uh, indirectly in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, in the commandment of the Day of Atonement, or the Yom Kippur rites. The high priest is commanded to make a cloud of incense. Now, the word cloud doesn't always come out in translation, but trust me, it's there in the Hebrew, whether or not it's in the English translation or not. But the point, the purpose of the cloud of incense is to screen the presence of the Lord in the inner sanctuary. Why is that necessary? Well, <laughs> because no one can see God and live. And also because the great cloud was on Mount Sinai, which surrounded God's holy presence there. It looks back to the Moses experience. This Anan, or cloud of incense, therefore both protects the high priest from being killed by God's glory, but also memorializes Moses' uh, experience on Sinai in the Day of Atonement liturgy. Now, for another thing, we notice also that the law of Moses required that a perpetual flame should always be kept burning in front of the tabernacle. Now, this is commanded in Leviticus chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Now, I'll put a diagram here below, but you can see in this diagram that everything inside the sanctuary is screened from the view of the people. But the fire on the external offering uh, offerings uh, is, is continues to be visible. Why is that? Well, think about it. Fire serves to draw people near to the sanctuary. It's cold in the desert, but they can't get too close lest they be burned. Well, this is exactly like Mount Sinai. When Moses went up the mountain, the people wanted to go. They were drawn to it, but they weren't allowed to go up or touch the mountain unless they died. This fire serves to commemorate and reactualize in liturgical form, the burning of Mount Sinai that Moses could go up to, but the people couldn't. Now, when Israel established itself in the Promised Land under King David later on, when God granted him rest from all his enemies, the same basic pattern of the perpetual burning altar uh, on the outside of, of the altar and also the altar of incense in the Holy of Holies was reproduced in the temple on Mount Moriah, the temple of David and Solomon. This, of course, also used fire and cloudy, smoky incense. In other words, all of the liturgy in Israel, be it in the tabernacle or the temple, centered around commemorating, memorializing, representing the ascent of Moses in Sinai. Here's an analogy. What's the center of the Christian religion? Well, arguably, it's the cross of Christ and the resurrection. Well, Moses going up to Mount Sinai to behold God face to face occupied an analogous role in Israel's religion. Now, with this we see now the enormous significance for a Jewish Christian like the author of the letter to the Hebrews telling us that Jesus has abolished these old rites as a new and better high priest, making an eternal offering in an even better sanctuary, a heavenly one, and get this, not only for himself, but in sharing and perfecting all of his brothers and sisters so that they too can enter the sanctuary and behold God face to face, just like Jesus did. Moses was a million times closer to the God of the universe than any Hebrew of antiquity, and yet for all that, Jesus has now achieved something beyond even Moses' wildest dreams. He's opened up God's inner life in the true heavenly sanctuary to share with all the people. As Hebrews 10, 19 puts it, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us, the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith.
to really get your mind and heart around this, you've got to understand the experience of Moses and Mount Sinai and how important that was in the Old Testament. And you also have to understand how crucial the Exodus story is to grasp the moral dimensions of the picture of salvation in the letter to the Hebrews. Remember, Christians are in an in-between time, just like the wilderness generation was. Christians have left Egyptian slavery, but Christians have not yet entered the future city, the promised land. All throughout Hebrews 12 and 13, the author uses examples from the wilderness tradition in the Torah to remind his readers what they should and shouldn't do. When you read Hebrews 12, uh, verses 12 through 24, listen to the imagery. The root of bitterness, what may not be touched, the blazing fire, the darkness, the gloom, the trumpet sound, the warning not to touch the mountain, the fear and dread even of Moses, all of these images are taken lock, stock, and barrel from the Exodus and Deuteronomy books as those traditions relate the Sinai story, Moses' ascent up the mountain. And again, we see another Kol Homer in verse 25, 1225. For if they did not escape one warning them on earth, how much less will they escape one who warns them from heaven? And verse 28, 29, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Why? Because our God is a consuming fire. Now that is language taken verbatim from Moses' ascent up Sinai, as recounted both in Exodus 24 and in Deuteronomy chapter 4. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what the new covenant looks like for the Hebrews writer, a covenant which allows God for the first time to commune directly with his children. Why? Because it's mediated by Jesus Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. The old covenant was provisional, inadequate, a mere shadow of the one to come, unable to deliver a sinless people capable of drawing near to the throne of grace. Exciting? Yes. Awesome? You bet. But here's the thing. When we think of this in terms of salvation and salvation history, it probably won't do to think of this in terms as a horizontal, gradually ascending timeline, which is the image we have often in the back of our minds. Me too. Um, this is really more like a direct ascent straight up. Moses gets to the top of Sinai. We get to go even higher with Jesus, our high priest, all the way up to the heavenly tabernacle to see our God face to face and share with him his inner life. Moses goes up to Sinai. We go up to the heavenly Jerusalem and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to a judge who is God of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect and to Jesus, the mediator of this new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks more eloquently than the blood of Abel. Wow. Or maybe better still, we could think of the new covenant as ushering down to earth the permanent things while the temporary provisional and figural things pass away. Hebrews speaks, after all, of the next world coming, the coming age, the Lord Jesus who will return. It tells us in chapter 13, verse 14, that we have no lasting city, but we seek the city which is to come. And that brings up a fascinating question. What about the promise to Abraham? How does this whole framework fulfill that promise? Well, the truth is the Hebrews writer never tells us. And given the centrality of the Abrahamic covenant for St. Paul's understanding of the gospel, well, this we need to see amounts to one of the many reasons for strong confidence that St. Paul is not the author of this epistle. It's different, it's complimentary, but different. On the other hand, maybe we can tease out of the text how Hebrews thinks the Abrahamic promise has been perfected, as he might put it. Well, the author is definitely aware of God's dealings with Abraham as a promise confirmed by an oath. And notice he never calls this a covenant. 
when he discusses it in chapter 9. If he did that, he'd be confusing his readers a little bit because when he discusses covenant in Hebrews 9 and 10, there's really only two of them, the old one and the new one. Eh, I lied to you a little bit when I said that there's a series of them. There are in Paul's framework, but not really in the Hebrews writer's framework. For him, the new one is the one that's coming. The old one is provisional and temporary. The new one will be eternal. On the other hand, the promise to Abraham and his inheritance, despite being mentioned in the Old Testament, really do belong to that which is eternal. Well, at least kind of, right? Notice what it says about Abraham's faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Abraham, it tells us, sojourned in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, for he looked forward to the city whose foundations and builder and maker is God. In other words, a city that was exactly the opposite of the Tower of Babel city constructed by man in Genesis 10 and 11. Hmm, that's interesting that there's a parallel there. In 11.13, Hebrews 11.13, the author talks more about the kind of faith that Abraham had. What does it say about them and their generation? Well, they did not receive what had been promised, but they saw it and greeted it from afar and acknowledged themselves to be strangers and aliens on earth. For those who speak thus show that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had come, that is, Ur of the Chaldees, well, they could have had the opportunity to go back and return, but now they desire a better homeland, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Now, we can say that God's promise to Abraham is taken up, as it were, into this ascending, descending salvation history of the Hebrews author. Abraham was really a sojourner on earth, waiting for the heavenly home that Jesus has opened for him. Or we could say that Abraham is waiting for the city that was to come. Now, although the Hebrews writer goes on to praise Abraham and Sarah for their resurrection faith, just like Paul did in Romans chapter 4, Bear in mind, this is a very different understanding of covenant fulfillment than Paul's, as we will see in future lessons when we start to discuss more of Paul's reading of the Old Testament, and in particular, the promise to Abraham, and the role of the law when we get to that in a future lesson. I can't wait.